Joining us now, Hugh Ainsworth, who covered the assassination for the Dallas Morning News. He has a new book out called November 22nd, 1963, Witness to History. Mike Cochran, who covered it for the Associated Press here in Dallas and in Fort Worth. And Dr. Ronald Jones, now head of the uh, uh, surgery at Baylor University. He back then was chief surgical resident at Parkland Hospital. Hugh, I want to start with you because you were one of the few people who saw President Kennedy being shot. Uh, you later were there when Lee Harvey Oswald was shot, and you also were there when Lee Harvey Oswald was captured uh, at the Texas Theater. Uh, what was this like when these shots rang out? You were just not far from where we are right now in Dealey Plaza. Within seconds, it was complete pandemonium. People were throwing their children down, protecting them. People were running into each other. People were screaming and crying. It was just the most hectic thing you could imagine. And, and it was such a contrast because people had been so happy at all this. Uh, Mike Cochran, you were the AP guy in Fort Worth. You worked out of the uh, newsroom of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram where I was a reporter. Uh, it had gone very well in Fort Worth. <clears throat> Oh, it had gone beautifully. The people uh, of Fort Worth, I mean, the welcome it was just amazing. They uh, obviously, obviously adored the president and Jacqueline, and it was it was really heartwarming. And it was uh, the the people of the Hotel Texas, both outside and inside, were just seemed to be beside themselves. And it was it was really quite a moving. Episode. Well, I remember uh, the reporters who were there and covered him, and you were there. You were kind of relieved uh, when when the story moved to Dallas. Yes, I uh, <clears throat> uh, left the Hotel Texas and went to Carswell and phoned what would have been what was the final wheels up bulletin for President Kennedy mm -hmm. when the plane took off for the short hop to Dallas. I walked back when I got back to the office. I I walked through the newsroom of the Star Telegram, and uh, as I passed the news desk, I kind of stopped and quipped, and I said, "Well, we got him out of boards. We got him out of town safely." Yeah. Went into my office. I sat down at my desk, and just minutes later, a copy boy screamed. He torn some copy off the Associated Press printer, and he screamed, "The president's been shot!" Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, Doctor, uh, you were at Parkland Hospital there. Uh, we didn't know what had happened. What, 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 how did you feel when you, you got word of this? I had just finished an operative procedure that morning and gone down to the cafeteria to have lunch, and the page operator began to call people stat, re respond immediately, including the chief of surgery, who I knew was out of town. And I called the operator and I said, why are you paging everyone stat? And she said, Dr. Jones, the president's been shot and they're bringing him to the emergency room and they need physicians right away. And so Dr. Perry and I ran out the back of the cafeteria, down the hall, down steps, and to the emergency room and into trauma room one. And Mrs. Kennedy was on the left of the door as I entered. The president was on a stretcher, arms out on arm boards. And I noticed a small hole in the front of the neck that I may estimate to be about a quarter of an inch. And I knew he had a large wound in the back of his head, the extent of which I wasn't sure because we hadn't examined him that closely. And Dr. Carrico was trying to get an airway going. And uh, Dr. Perry decided he would do a tracheotomy and I would do a cut down in the upper arm. And he was alive at that point, but just barely. Dr. Carrico thought he had seen some attempts at respiration. Whether that was true or just a neurologic response, I don't know. When I saw him, he was motionless, his eyes were open, he was staring, and I never saw any evidence of, of life as such. But nevertheless, we decided to try to do something rather than do nothing, because occasionally you can get somebody brought back. But we didn't know the extent of that brain injury at that time. All right, we're going to take a break here, and then we're going to come back and talk about what happened after that in a minute. Now, Hugh Ainsworth, you, you had been there in Dealey Plaza and saw this happen, and then you were in the police station uh, that, uh, that morning when, when Oswald was shot. Tell us a little bit about what that was like. Well, you know, I was somewhat concerned because there had been many death threats through the night, 
And when I got up and found out they had moved him, I, I just, I was amazed. I grabbed my wife and I said, we've got to get down there. So we ran like the devil for the police station. I got in just a very few minutes before they brought him out. Now, the I did not see Ruby. I was probably three or four feet people behind. But all of a sudden we heard this pop and just, it was almost like being the first day two days later because everyone went wild. And there were so many international reporters there. They were speaking different languages and pushing and shoving. And you know they had those huge cameras in those days and everybody was getting bumped around. But it was, it was a good while before we knew it was Ruby. You had known uh, Jack Ruby, did you not, or knew of I him? I had known him for about three years. Why do you think he did it? I think he wanted to be somebody. He was quite a show off. He, he was not a nice man. He had a huge temper. And I'd see him at the newspaper every week, a couple of times. He was a groupie for newsmen and cops. Mike, uh, what happened? You were you were back in Fort Worth. You had no idea of coming to Dallas, did you? Uh, How, not not in the beginning, but the uh, uh, after the uh, after we heard the president had been shot. Well, uh, my, my wife had dropped me off after we'd gone to Cartwell, so I didn't have a car. But I jumped in with a bunch of Star Telegram writers and photographers and, and just headed over to Parkland. But the most amazing thing that happened to you was the burial of Lee Harvey Oswald where you actually became a pole bearer, <laughs> as it were, in that funeral. You and three reporters from the Star-Telegram. Tell us how that happened. Well, it, it really, it was at Rose Hill Cemetery in Fort Worth and of course I was based in Fort Worth and so uh, I was assigned to cover it. We'd gotten the tip the night before. I was in Dallas, in the Dallas Bureau the night before, uh, after uh, Oswald had been mm -hmm. killed. And, but we, we got a tip that there would be the funeral in Fort Worth the next day. And so when I showed up, uh, uh, of course, there, just, there, were, there, there were nobody, I mean, we were early. They delivered the casket, the police escort delivered the casket about 1.30. And, uh, but as the day went on, you know, there were no mourners there. Yeah. Uh, just. And so how did it happen? The, the funeral home operator said, somebody's got to help us get this casket out of the hearse. Well, they, what, it, it, as we were waiting, you know, the, the, one of the, the strange, one of the strangest things at about three o'clock, somewhere around three o'clock, uh -huh. a rumor started that the casket was empty that there was nobody in that uh -huh. casket, and if there was anybody in that casket, it was not Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. And so it became caused such a stir that the, the police chief, Cato Hightower, and a couple of officers went into the little chapel, checked, and came back out and assured us that at least Oswald was but in in the you and the reporters uh, carried the casket out to the grave site. And that's right, Doctor. Uh, let me ask you: you <laughs> were called back to the emergency room for the when they brought uh, Lee Oswald. Was he alive when he got there? He was alive when he got there. There were four of us that uh, got to trauma room two, which is where the Con doc, uh, pre uh, Governor Conley had been, and he did have a heartbeat. And um, he had been shot in the left chest and had major vascular injuries. Uh, as Jack Ruby shot him, he turned like this, and that caused a lot of more of injuries than if he'd taken the shot straight on. But uh, same thing, I put a, did a cut down in the upper arm, just as I had in the president, and inserted a chest tube. And we had him to surgery within about 10 minutes after he came to the emergency room. And he lived almost an hour, and, roughly an hour and 20 minutes before uh, he expired on the table. But he said nothing. He said nothing. He was unconscious, uh, much as the president looked, but he had a heartbeat and was alive when he came to the emergency room. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and we'll be back in a moment.